Imagine if J.S. Bach had been a short-lived, turn-of-the-century Russian with an affinity for bizarre time signatures. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Alexei Stenchinsky. Stenchinsky was born in March of 1888, and as a child became known for his excellent performances of the great pieces of the past displaying a seemingly intuitive pianistic knowledge. His parents were musical in their own right, and his sister was also possessed of talent, but Alexei stood out from them all. When he was six, he was also trying his hand at composition, something he would end up pursuing more so than his performances, although he always kept his piano skills in tip-top shape. He began formal studies in the piano and composition for several years before officially entering the Moscow Conservatory. Now, Stanchinsky had a fragile countenance, and he couldn't stand actually living within Moscow's borders. So he commuted and took some classes via correspondence, which was really rare for the time, and he actually might have been the first composer to take lessons through the mail. Stanchinsky also showed an aptitude for language and the visual arts. He was also a playful fellow. At one point, he had slightly injured his right hand, and so wrote a letter to his parents with his left. And since he was normally right-handed, he compensated for this by writing it so that they had to read it in a mirror. He soon became known as the best and brightest student of the acclaimed composition professor Sergei Taneyev, who introduced the budding composer to the author Leo Tolstoy, someone whom Stanchinsky greatly admired, because Stanchinsky was very much inspired by works of literature. However, after a few years studying at the conservatory, he got word that his father had passed away, and the grief was simply too much for his fragile psyche to bear. He slept in the chapel next to his father's uninterred body, and when friends and family came around the next day, they found him unresponsive, and he was consigned to a mental hospital. As it turns out, he had developed what we today would call schizophrenia, and he spent the next year interred in a psychiatric ward. Doctors were initially encouraged by Stanchinsky's occasional lucidity, but eventually they lost all hope, declared him incurable, and released him. After his release, he spent a significant amount of time in the Russian countryside, dedicating himself to collecting folk music. Sometime later, he ended up back at the Moscow Conservatory, seemingly refreshed and rejuvenated back to his old self. He worked diligently on his compositions and wished to craft his own unique voice. He was able to do this via an enormous focus on counterpoint, combined with an affinity for unusual time signatures. You can find 2116 in his Prelude in the Lydian Mode, and 118 in his second piano sonata, just to name a few. This is all tempered by a tempestuous Russian sound. Alexander Skriabin's voice looms large in these compositions, and Skriabin himself professed affinity for Stenchinsky's achievements. The focus on counterpoint manifested itself in the canons and fugues that dot his compositional output, but he was very stringent about what he wanted to put out and often burned anything that didn't meet his very high standards. It was up to his friends and colleagues to save the pieces he had burned or attempted to burn. Sometimes they reconstructed them from memory. This has led to several instances in his published work where chords are given slightly altered versions, or osias, with a question mark. Like Frédéric Chopin, the focus of his music was on the piano, indicating his comfortability at his own instrument. When he had enough material to share with the public, he did so in a 1914 recital, given a few months before his 26th birthday. He liked playing in public, despite the stringent self-criticism he gave to his own performances. Things were looking up for Stanchinsky, and he often spoke of his future plans to his friends and colleagues. But unfortunately, his 26th birthday was to be his last. That October, he went missing, only for his body to show up, drowned in a creek in the Crimean countryside. It was suspected that his schizophrenia was actually a very early onset form of dementia that manifested itself in bipolar periods of calm and rage. These periods of insanity were the ones in which he attempted to burn most of his creative work, and it's unknown how much of his music was lost during these periods. While his death remains a mystery, the most enduring theory, and unfortunately its most likely cause, was that of suicide. When discussing short-lived composers, Stanchinsky's name often crops up, and for good reason. At its core, his music is a deeply woven contrapuntal web of texture, and he possessed command of his own voice 
long before composers generally even find theirs. Similar to his Russian compatriots, he was fascinated by the loosening grip of tonal structure. And while his music is not atonal, he often used modes and synthetic scales for impacting the musical tension. Yet even his more traditional tonal music is incredibly unique. Because of the aforementioned weird time signatures and his affinity for large melodic leaps, he was able to write fugues that had their own unique identity without even needing a single accidental. His economy of means and his intense focus on architecture led him to be called the Tonal Webern, after his austere Austrian near contemporary. As early Scriabin was a continuation of Chopin, so too was Stanchinsky to early Scriabin. Stanchinsky's work has made a relatively recent comeback. Long hailed amongst a small group, his pieces are just now getting out to performers who are looking for something fresh and challenging. In recent years, many of his pieces have received world premiere recordings. This comeback is not helped by the fact that much of his music is exceedingly hard to read, and his music had to be cobbled together from many different sources, often manuscripts or reconstructions, and eventually was published by his friends in 1930, over 15 years after his death, and long after the musical world had forgotten him. Not only this, but several more pieces, such as his Piano Trio, a piece that many people see rightly as his magnum opus, had to wait nearly 40 more years for publication. Now, however, we can say that he's finally getting his long-deserved accolades. <laughs> ¶¶ 